out on the plains down near Santa Fe. I met a cowboy. Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with New York City-based jazz singer Hilary Gardner on the 2024 CD Lonesome Pines with On the Trail. It comes out on March 8, 2024 on Anzic Records. In the early weeks and months of the pandemic, confined to her Brooklyn apartment in the silent city, she dreamed of wide open spaces and the freedom to roam. As such, she started researching trail songs from the singing cowboy era of the 30s and 40s, drawn to the images and the lyrics, Silver Stars, Purple hills, slumbering shadows, and the lights of old Santa Fe glinting in the distance. We covered the adventure this project was and is, surviving COVID, upcoming shows, and so much more. Dig in. How are you? Everything's good. How's life? It's good. It's pretty hectic right now, but in a, in a good way. Yeah, it's, it's cool. Um, thanks for making the time to do this on such short notice. I mean, that just came up very quick. It's great. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's great. I'm I'm glad you reached out. I am excited to get into Lonesome Pines. But, you know, as you had mentioned up front, just about being busy, and it's a good thing. You know, we've all, we're coming up on that four-year anniversary of the pandemic. And just to kind of put it into some kind of succinct nature here, how did you ultimately get through that time period? And how good does it feel to actually be busy now and to have a resumption of life? Um, well, you know, in the in the moment, it was it was actually kind of a crazy thing in the lead up to it, um, not the lead up to it when everything went off the rails. Um, I was with my vocal trio, Duchess, and we we had a gig in Atlanta scheduled for March twelfth or thirteenth in twenty twenty, which was um, we flew to Atlanta, I think, on the eleventh, the night of the eleventh, and it was very much like, are we going to do this? Is this happening? And yes, come on down. <laughs> so we we flew down. And, um, and while we were there, that was whatever night that was, that was the night that, you know, the NBA canceled their season when everything, that was really the tipping point when everything started to close down. So the next day, instead of doing our gig, we got on a plane and came right back home. And, um, and then I think like everybody else, I was just kind of, you know, at home watching headlines and getting pretty anxious and just taking it day by day. I mean, it, I didn't really do any, any music and I wasn't really interested in doing any music. I was just kind of um, trying to make sense of that new reality. And uh, my life has changed a lot since then. You know, I'm, I'm doing a lot of different music. I'm doing a, a different sort of um, a, a professional life. And um, it, it's, it's been a big, a big shift, but um, you know, we're not in the same world as we were before, but, uh, but it also provided a lot of clarity. Just, I, I realized in that time that all I really wanted was to make music that I really care about with people that I really care about and um, to then just kind of let the rest be. I just don't want to, I didn't want to be striving quite so, so hard and um, just think more about what, where does my heart really want to go with music. So that's where, that's how I wound up doing this project. So this project, you started researching trail songs from the, the singing cowboy era of the 30s and 40s. And that's kind of how this project came about. So kind of delve a little bit more into that and how it all ultimately came to fruition. Sure. Um, I There was that period in, in uh, where we were all kind of making music online or in, in my case, you know, not really making music at all. I, I really hated everything being, you know, online. And um, I have a good friend, the marvelous guitarist and cowboy and um, comedian and writer. He's a, he's a Renaissance fan, Bruce Foreman, who's based out in California. And I've known Bruce for years. And he was doing this, uh, this thing where he would, you know, have singers or, you know, other people that he knew uh, in music do something musically, sing a tune, whatever, a cappella, and then he would accompany them on his guitar online. You know, it was, it was very, um, it was this very uh, kind of make do with what you can sort of thing. And, and he asked me if I wanted to, to do one. And I did, but I really wasn't interested in, in doing standards at that moment. I just, I don't know, something really was shifting um, for me. And so that was how I came upon Twilight on the Trail. And 
because I was thinking about kind of cowboy songs because Bruce and I share a love of country music. I grew up singing country music and Bruce and I have, have talked about that a lot. And, and for that particular um, pairing, I thought it would be fun to do something kind of in that vein. And I, I found Twilight on the Trail and was so immediately drawn into the imagery in the lyrics and to the mood that the song created, just this deeply atmospheric kind of cinematic quality of, of the song. And then I just, we, it, it was just a, a springboard into what I would discover was a whole kind of, uh, body of work that's been pretty neglected for the past, you know, many decades because it's not really strictly jazz and it's not really strictly country music. It's something unique. Uh, and, and it stands alone. And so I just started diving in. Um, I, I learned a lot of these tunes just directly from the sheet music, I, which was an interesting process because, you know, you're not encumbered by previous versions or interpretations of, of a song when you're looking, just when you're learning it from notes on a page. Um, and then in uh, the fall of 2021, I got together with uh, my good friend Noah Garabedian on bass, who introduced me with Justin Poindexter, um, he introduced me to Justin, who I'd been a fan of for some time, guitarist and, and singer Justin Poindexter. The three of us started playing this music, and then we started doing some gigs, and we added Aaron Thurston on drums, and it just felt like a band right away. So the, the thing about the West is it's, it's always remained relevant. There's, there, I mean, you can go back to these songs, you can go back to this era, and reintroduce it into this modern 2024 time, and it's still going to be just as fresh with your spin on it. What's what's your what's your thought? What's your take on that? I think that's a great point and a great uh, a great question um, because this there's this sort of literal historical American West, and then there's the West that this project kind of centers on, which is it, 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 it's a West that lives in our imaginations. It's an idealized American West. It kind of exists as much as metaphor as anything else. Um, and, you know, if you travel anywhere in the world and someone knows you're an American, they'll probably bring up cowboys. It's just, it's such a, a, a recognizable symbol. And I think the whole idea of, you know, heading West, um, in this romantic kind of archetypal sense has to do with the, the freedom to roam. Um, so much of the imagery in these songs is about the beauty of nature and experiencing that in solitude. There's a really contemplative quality. Um, and I think there's a simplicity and an earnestness and a forthrightness that, um, that in 2024 certainly you know, to have something that is just, it's devoid of irony. It's not trying to be too clever. It's just saying, you know, this is a beautiful story. These are beautiful images. Um, you know, there's a lot of, there are a lot of answers or, or at least explorations to big questions um, that, that we can, that we can find when we're in nature, when we're um, letting ourselves be still when we're alone. So I think I think the romantic American West looms very large in our collective psyche. And certainly, you know, in the 1930s through, I think, the 1950s and to an extent, the 60s even, there were these, the, the singing cowboy era had its heyday kind of in the 30s to the, the 50s probably. But then with shows like, you know, Bonanza and Gunsmoke and these, these various programs, um, it was a massive, massive industry in Hollywood and in film, television, this idea of, of telling these stories about the West. So what are you ultimately hoping the listener gets from this album? Um, gosh, that's another really good question. I, I hope that they, um, I hope that they are as pleasantly surprised and delighted to discover a lot of these songs as I was, you know, only two of the songs on the album were at all familiar to me. Um, I, I already knew I'm an old cow hand and I had heard cow cow boogie. The rest of the songs were all new. And what I think is really wonderful is that in the thirties and the forties, the people who were writing and performing these songs were totally unconstrained by genre. They, they might be singing in front of a big band. They might be riding a horse in a Gene Autry movie, but these were just really great songs. And it didn't really matter what, what someone called it. Is it a jazz song? Is it a pop song? Is it a soundtrack kind of a film 
a filmic sort of song? Is it a country song? It didn't matter. They were just really, really good songs. And so I, I just hope that more people um, discover this music along with me and enjoy this repertoire, which uh, which I think deserves to be wide, more widely known. So what's going on as far as live shows, touring, the warm months are coming? How's everything opening up for you? Yeah. Um, well, we've got a show... Um, on March 3rd, which is this, which is, you know, day after tomorrow, Sunday, March 3rd, and it's the, the CD release event. Uh, that's happening here in New York City at the Birdland Theater. Um, so that's, that's super exciting. I've got the full band, which includes, of course, Justin Poindexter, Noah Garabedi, and Aaron Thurston on guitar, bass, and drums, respectively, and also Sasha Popernick on accordion and vocals. Um, so we're, we're doing some really fun uh, three-part harmony singing and, um, playing, you know, everything from the record and some some new stuff as well. So that's really fun. Um, the official album release date is actually uh, next Friday, March 8th. So the record will be available everywhere you get your music on, on Friday, March 8th. And uh, we're definitely looking, casting our eyes toward the, the gig horizon. I would love to take this project out, out west, actually. Um, I think it would be really fun. Uh, we've gotten some great press. We just got... Um, the album was the jazz album of the week um, listed in the Times in the UK, uh, which was a really uh, cool, unexpected thing to have happen. And um, yeah, we're just, we're getting some great feedback. So definitely more to come. So, I mean, looking at the calendar and seeing, you know, March 8th and seeing this coming out, it just has to feel good because of everything that fell away in that fateful March and how we kind of went through this. So it, it almost seems like kind of, we're, we're, we're still living through kind of this rebirth and, um, um, yeah, it, it has to feel good, I would imagine. So that is such a, I didn't actually even think about that. <laughs> um, but you're right. Yeah. There's a certain symmetry to it. And, um, you know, this project, um, for various logistical reasons, um, it, it's, you know, it's been a little bit of a protracted process. So I, I am thrilled that it's, that it's getting out into the world. And I think you've actually touched on something, um, really resonant about this idea of a rebirth and, and, you know, it seems like everybody's doing something. Um, there's a little bit of, I keep using this term, this twang zeitgeist right now. Like there's a lot of people doing sort of Western and Western adjacent uh, projects, including, you know, Beyonce. Um, and I think that these ideas of, of new beginnings, which are very much uh, symbolized in the romantic American West. Um, I think that is probably certainly a part of that, this wider sort of appreciation of, of this kind of music um, is, is just this idea that, yeah, it is, in, we are in a new landscape, right? Um, no matter where or who we are, um, things are different than they were before. And, and these songs are certainly, they cast an optimistic uh, glow on that, on that reality. And, and I think it maybe harkens to that idea of a simpler time and slowing things down, which was kind of a metaphor of living through this time period, was that things did slow down. The musicians were always running and going crazy, and kind of that whole Western notion was that it's just, you're kind of boiling things down to its essentials, to its basics. 100%, absolutely. And and I think, too, getting down, yeah, distilling down to the essence of, like, what really matters here? Why am I Why am I doing this? what what do I really want? And, I, you know, I'm not sure how um, how much this is related in a macro sense or if it's just kind of my own personal, my own personal journey. But um, I know a number of people, myself emphatically included, who have become, you know, increasingly conflicted with, um, with regard to social media, um, with everything being kind of instantaneous, with everything being public facing, and this sort of just, striving, 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 um, and, and promoting. And, I, and, and those are all important and necessary things, of course, uh, if you want to have a career. But there does also have to kind of be this counterbalance where you're staying in touch with why you're making music in the first place, with why, you know, any of us are creating whatever it is that we create. And to your point, I think that these songs definitely do bring you into the moment. I mean, so many of them are just about like, when I look around at this landscape that I'm in, I notice, you know, the silver on the stage, there's the moon above, there's purple hills in the distance, and just sort of being present um, with one's place in the world. 
and at peace with kind of, with solitude, which I think is also um, a really beautiful idea and, and something that I, is harder and harder to come by, at least in New York City in 2024. I'm not sure about everywhere, but um, but certainly peace and quiet and wide open spaces are, are beautiful and necessary. Absolutely. So the new album, Lonesome Pines, March 8th, Anzic Records, you know, it'll be streaming. You can get it on Bandcamp. And if anybody wants to find out about live shows, anything in your world, where's the best place to go? HillaryGardner.com. Absolutely. And um, it's just Hillary with one L. That's the only thing to remember. Um, but yeah, HillaryGardner.com. All of the news is there and all of the links to music, wherever you get it, um, can be found. That's a good central, central place to be. It's always so good to catch up with you, Hillary. Thank you so much. Best of luck with this. Have a blast with it. Thank you so much, Joe. It's great to chat with you, and uh, I, just, I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Chess interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players and minds in Kansas City, New York City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. Thanks to Hillary for coming back to Neon Jazz. It's always a joy. If you want to hear more Neon Jazz interviews, you can find us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Subscribe to us at YouTube, and for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.